Um, my name is Helen Nicholl. I am a clinical educator here at Origin, the National Centre for Excellence in Youth Mental Health. And just to introduce Dr. Chris Davey. Um, Chris Davey is a consultant psychiatrist at Origin. He leads a team of psychiatrists, psychologists, and other healthcare professionals in the Mood Clinic um, who assess and manage young people with severe and complex mood disorders. Chris completed his medical degree at the University of Western Australia and trained in psychiatry in Sydney and Melbourne. He complete, completed his PhD at the University of Melbourne and his research interests include studying effective treatments for depression and using neuroimaging to better understand depression and its treatment. So thank you, Chris. I'll hand over to you. Oh, thanks for the introduction, Helen. So today I'm going to be talking about um, medications for um, depression and um, provide some updates um, on uh, about what recent evidence tells us about what is effective um, for, for depression. So I guess I wanted to start with a, um, a couple of vignettes. And these are based on patients I've assessed in the past month where we're thinking about what we do with treatment and, uh, and hopefully it sort of uh, gives you a sense of the sort of patients we're seeing that we're thinking about uh, medication treatment. Um, so Jean is a 16 year old student who lives at home with her parents and older sister. She has a two year history of low mood with further deterioration over the past couple of months. Her low mood is accompanied by difficulties with sleep, with fatigue, poor concentration, a lack of appetite and marked self criticism. She's uh, thinking about death and about dying, though she has no overt suicidal thoughts. And while she's been a very high achieving student, she's uh, dropped out of school for the past four weeks and isn't very keen to return despite um, the worries of her parents. She's seen three therapists in the past 12 months, has attended about 20 sessions of therapy without significant improvement. And uh, now Gina and her parents are asking whether we might consider using a medication for her. And then there's Brian, an 18 year old man in year 12, and lives at home with his parents and two brothers. He's experiencing low mood for the past three years, which has uh, got worse recently. His low mood is accompanied by difficulties with sleep, real lack of energy and motivation, and significant irritability. He has some um, suicidal thoughts so without a specific plan at the moment. He has made two suicide attempts um, by overdose in the past, and he's been seeing the same therapist for the past 18 months. He's currently taking venlafaxine at 225 milligrams daily, which is the highest dose we go to with that medication. And he's previously trialled fluoxetine and sertraline, neither of which had significant effects on his mood. And both uh, Brian and his mother are now asking, you know, what, what will we do um, with uh, treatment to help him get better from his depression? So we just keep those sort of vignettes in mind when um, we consider what the evidence suggests we should, we should do, or, or conversely, whether there is really enough evidence to tell us what we should do. So a brief history of um, antidepressants. You know, the first antidepressants were developed in the 1950s. Um, they were both really discovered serendipitously. Hyperonizid was developed in 1951 as a treatment for tuberculosis, and it was observed during the treatment that patients seemed to show an improvement in their mood. And this was the, uh, identified as the first of what's called a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Imipramine was initially developed as a um, sedative um, histaminergic medication, but it was also observed that when people were treated with imipramine that they seemed to show an improvement in, the, in their mood. And this was, became the first of a class of drugs known as the tricyclic antidepressants. Now both medications, uh, both classes of medications are rarely used now because they have significant side effects. Um, so we um, rarely use them and use more modern antidepressants, but they're just as effective in their, in their effects on depression um, than the, um, as the newer antidepressants. And what these are, uh, both these classes of antidepressants did was allow um, people to examine, once they realised they seemed to have an effect on depression, determine how they might have affected, had an effect on depression, and really led um, people to focus um, on the monoamine systems. These are systems in the brain um, that um, originate in the brain stem and secrete neurotransmitters uh, um, throughout the brain, primarily consisting of serotonin, 
noradrenaline and dopamine. And most of the antidepressants we use now work on these systems. This is um, quite busy figure. The detail isn't important, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a schematic of a serotonergic neuron. We have the neuron on the top um, synthesizing serotonin, releasing serotonin from the end of the nerve terminal. Um, that serotonin uh, travels across the nerve terminal, hits a receptor on the, uh, the, the what's called the postsynaptic neuron that sets off a cascade of events. And the antidepressants, most of the antidepressants, including the Mayos, the tricyclic antidepressants, and the more uh, modern antidepressants, all work on this system. One of the main mechanisms of action for the more modern antidepressants is blocking the reuptake of this serotonin after it's been secreted by the serotonergic neuron, therefore, um, with, which, with therefore more serotonin in the intrasynaptic space. And that, um, for, by, by mechanisms we're not entirely sure of, um, alleviates depression, or at least in some cases. In fact, by observing, um, observing um, the, this mechanism of action of the antidepressants, that this uh, monoamine hypothesis um, was developed, which said that antidepressants increase the synaptic monoamine availability, so increase the amount of serotonin or noradrenaline um, um, in, in, in the brain. So therefore, you know, depression must be caused by reduced um, levels of these, uh, of these chemicals. But um, this chemical imbalance theory really isn't supported by the evidence and uh, it probably never was and is almost certainly wrong and I think uh, most um, serious uh, um, clinicians and researchers have uh, little time for it. In fact, um, antidepressants work in, in, are likely to work in a much more complex way. So while um, you know, they may block the reuptake of serotonin after it's secreted, um, and therefore allow more serotonin to be in the uh, intrasynaptic cleft and, um, and interacting with the serotonin receptor, this then leads to a whole lot of downstream effects. And again, the detail of this slide isn't important, but just to illustrate what happens um, um, within a neuron when, ser when serotonin is interacting with it, there's a cascading effect that eventually leads most likely to new genes being transcribed and it's uh, for, for neurogenesis or new nerve um, development. And it's likely that um, these are more um, responsible for the antidepressant response. One of the arguments in favor of this is that antidepressants take you know, four to six weeks before we start seeing a beneficial effect from it. And that's about the sort of time scale in which new genes are transcribed and you see nerve growth. So it fits that idea, but it's still very much um, an open question as to exactly how these medications have their antidepressant effects, even if a very short-term effect is to do, for example, is to, is to, for example, block the reuptake of serotonin. That the effect of that will be present, and we uh, be uh, evident within half an hour, but the antidepressant effects aren't present for four to six weeks. There's clearly some uh, something much more complex going on in order for there to be an improvement in mood. So in the 1980s, you know, the, the, a new class of medications were developed and these were the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You know, they were medications that actually blocked the reuptake of serotonin after it was secreted from the nerve terminal. So there's more serotonin in this intrasynaptic cleft available to interact with the serotonin receptors. And this kind of led to, uh, I guess, what's sometimes called the, the Prozac revolution in that these antidepressants weren't any more effective than the older antidepressants, but they were much better tolerated. They weren't uh, potentially fatal in overdose, and they had a milder side effect profile. So the common, um, the common medications available now in Australia, uh, fluoxetine, which was called Prozac, now out of patent, um, sold as Lovan often, or, or as a, any number of um, um, generic, uh, um, generic uh, brands. It's sertraline, Zoloft, um, and again, a number of uh, generic brands. And all of these medications are now are potent, so they, while they have these uh, um, is associated with uh, their initial trademarks, and they can be sold in any number of names. There's citalopram or cipramil, escitalopram, or Lexapro, and paroxetine or Arapax. So they generally have a you know, relatively benign side effect profile. The most common side effects are the cause gastrointestinal upset and agitation, 
in the early days of starting it, it almost always resolves, they're not always. And uh, in longer term effects uh, commonly cause sexual dysfunction and can also cause side effects such as headaches, neither of which um, often do disappear, unlike the uh, symptoms which were um, evident earlier. So that was um, then with, with those medications, there was really this explosion in the use of antidepressants. New antidepressants were developed in the 1990s. There's a class, um, the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, which is the second major class of antidepressants we use now. So these not only block the reuptake of serotonin, but also another monoamine um, by the name of noradrenaline. So it has this dual action. And the common antidepressants um, available in Australia is venlafaxine, it's very close relative, relative desvenlafaxine and geloxetine. And these medications have similar side effect profiles to the SSRIs. They are likely um, um, cause more agitation, more likely to cause high blood pressure. And significantly in the young people we see, they have worse discontinuation effects. And these are the effects that you um, get from the medications when you stop them. And uh, they can uh, make people feel very agitated and out of sorts if they stop suddenly and we see some quite severe reactions in young people who do stop these medications suddenly. And then there's a whole range of medications which aren't used commonly. Some of them are, are fairly new and they have um, you know, um, a miscellaneous um, types of activity. So there's metazapine, which is actually um, reasonably old. That's a medication that um, as an antagonist action, meaning it blocks the receptors without causing any activity in that receptor. Um, Reboxetine, um, which blocks just the reuptake of noradrenaline, so a little bit um, like the SSRIs, just has this action on the one neurotransmitter system. Um, Meglobamide, which is similar to the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, so it has less um, serious side effects. Um, Adamelotin, which is a newly developed antidepressant which works on the melatonin system, and uh, Vortioxetine, which has only just been um, released for use in Australia. And that has um, a partial agonist activity of the serotonin receptor and also inhibits the reuptake of the serotonin. And I should say the evidence for the, um, these medications, especially in younger people, um, is, is really lacking. And I think it'd be fair to say are seen as um, um, less effective antidepressants in older people too. Antidepressant use in Australia is rising steadily through the years. This is not accounted for by an increase in our population because the, this data is um, per capita, so it's uh, um, corrected for the number of uh, people in the population. And we see this very steady increase um, since 2000 in the number of antidepressants, you know, the, the volume of antidepressants used here. When we look at a worldwide comparison, and this data was out um, not so long ago, comparing um, um, countries in the OECD and Australia um, in this chart had the second highest rate of antidepressant use after Iceland. The US is missing from this chart. It's probably would be um, would use uh, have a higher rate of antidepressant use than even Iceland, but Australia does seem to have a particularly high rate of antidepressant use. And when we look at antidepressant use over the lifespan, we can see that um, use really peaks in middle age, um, you know, where depression um, is common, but it's uh, just as common in younger people as it is in older people, and there is uh, significantly less antidepressant use in younger people. So it's still reasonably substantial um, and rises sharply where it's uh, from childhood and the pre-pupil years where use is fairly uncommon to much more common use in those years post-puberty. So the early trials of antidepressants in young people and especially when, we, um, when the SSRIs were released in the 1980s we're seen as these fairly benign medications um, with fairly dramatic effects on depression. Early trials of their use in young people suggested they you know, had this very clear, unambiguous effect on younger people and um, led to significant improvement in, in the mood of children and adolescents. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for their use 
and uh, use really um, um, steadily rose um, till the mid 2000s. What happened in the mid 2000s is we started seeing some data which suggested that maybe the story wasn't quite so clear cut. In 2004, Craig Whittington and his colleagues um, published a paper in The Lancet, which really for the first time started to question the antidepressant story in young people. And what was novel about their approach was that they not only um, analysed data that had been published in the literature, but they um, got hold of data that hadn't been published. One of the, um, one of the things about antidepressants or medications generally is that in order to um, um, be able, for doctors to be able to prescribe it, there's an approval process by which the pharmaceutical companies have to register their trials and provide all their data to the regulatory authorities, particularly the FDA in America. And so the data exists even when it hasn't been published. And what these researchers did was get hold of all the data, published and unpublished, and synthesise it together. And they really, for the first time, suggested that these medications weren't especially effective in young people when you looked at the data as a whole. This is a recent update on that sort of meta-analysis. Sarah Hetrick is one of the researchers here at Origin and it leads the Cochrane collaboration in this area. Um, has developed the, uh, the, the Cochrane review of antidepressants in young people and really shows findings that are quite consistent with those early, that earlier paper from um, Whittington and colleagues in demonstrating the effectiveness of these medications. So what we see here is a meta-analysis um, that includes studies for each of the medications. And what we want to see is that diamond shape to be clearly on the left of the line. Um, where it crosses the line, that suggests there's no evidence that that medication is more effective than placebo. And I think what you can appreciate is that um, for most medications, um, the diamond shape does in fact cross that cross the line, suggesting there is an evidence that's more effective than placebo. One medication does seem to show a clear advantage over placebo, and that's fluoxetine. And there have been uh, four or five large studies which have demonstrated that fluoxetine is more effective than placebo. It's um, not clear why fluoxetine should be more effective than the other medications. One, uh, one theory is it has a much longer half-life than the other medications. So uh, when young people take fluoxetine, um, when they forget to take it, I should say, it doesn't um, have a, a, as, um, a significant effect on the um, plasma levels of the fluoxetine. It's much more forgiving of um, people who miss their medication. But no one's quite clear as why well fluoxetine um, should um, be so should be more clearly differentiated from placebo than the other medication. You can appreciate that um, sertraline, nesitalopram, you know, may be marginally significant. And when you add, when you combine all the studies, there is um, there is evidence that on the whole, these medications are more effective than placebo, but not by not by a lot. The scale that um, that's used in most studies of child and adolescent depression is the child depression rating scale, the CDRS, which um, um, goes up to, is a scale measured in 140 odd um, points. And out of the 140 odd points, overall, there's a sort of four point difference between medication and the placebo, suggesting, um, you know, in the eyes of um, many investigators, that this is a, a clinically, clinically meaningful distinction. Uh, Jeffrey Bridge and uh, his colleagues um, sort of try to quantify just how effective these antidepressants were in, in their meta-analysis. And so they combined the trials in a similar way to um, Sarah Hetrick and Craig Whittington. And they showed that across um, 13 trials in child and adolescence treated with um, medication, that about 61% showed a response rate, but 50% of people showed a response um, to placebo, suggesting there isn't a significant um, difference between the antidepressants and placebo. They, um, they quantified it in a, um, a metric called the number needed to treat. And this um, is, uh, is a number that can give you a, a sense of just how effective a medication is. 
And what this suggests where the number need to treat of 10 is that you need to treat 10 people with medication compared to placebo for one of them to get better, um, which um, doesn't sound um, terribly impressive. And, uh, but, but I should say it's not out of the ballpark of many of the treatments we use in medicine. Floxetine fared somewhat better, so it has um, a larger effect size reflected in a smaller number needed to treat. So for fluoxetine, you need to treat six people with fluoxetine compared to placebo for one of them to get better, which again, probably doesn't sound terribly impressive and uh, nor is it, but, but not out of the ballpark of uh, many of the medications we use. Now from this bridge study about what we could see, so I said there's about a 61% response to um, medication um, uh, to antidepressant medication um, in young people with depression compared to 50% placebo, leaving a very small gap between medication and placebo. It's sometimes said that these medications are more, more effective for anxiety disorders than they are for depression. And the reason for that is not so much that there's a greater response rate, as you can appreciate from this chart, although there are subtle differences, but more that there's a much lower placebo rate, so the gap between medication and placebo is greater for anxiety disorders and for depression. And people might have seen this recent paper in The Lancet, which got a bit of media attention about uh, two or three months ago. And uh, again, sort of updating um, the, the sort of meta-analysis that, uh, that, that, that were done earlier. In this case, instead of just comparing each medication to placebo, they also accounted for trials that compared one medication to the other in what's called a network analysis. This didn't add a whole lot to what we already, um, what we saw from the previous analyses. The headline um, reported in most, um, in most media was that these medications weren't effective in young people. But in fact, it did um, show again that fluoxetine was more effective than placebo at a statistically significant level, if not clinically significant, and people would argue that. And the other finding, uh, more as a footnote really, was that fluoxetine is better tolerated than uh, geloxetine, the uh, SN SNRI we mentioned earlier. But it reinforced this idea and one of the, uh, an alternative headline, which I didn't read, was that, um, that it did sort of replicate this finding that fluoxetine does seem to be the most effective of these medications in young people. So the other finding that came out in the mid 2000s um, to complement really this idea that antidepressants weren't terribly effective in young people was that they caused this worrying side effect and that was that there seemed to be this clear um, association with an increase in suicidal behaviours in young people treated with antidepressant medications. So in this chart, you know, shows um, the odds ratios, what's the sort of likelihood that you will develop um, suicidal thoughts and behaviours treated with the medication compared to being treated with placebo. We have um, this confidence interval represented by this uh, black line, um, black horizontal line. And we want what we want to see here is we want to see that line um, intersecting with um, one on the uh, on the um, x-axis. Where it does that, then we see there's no significant um, there's no evidence of significant um, increase in suicidality. Where that line doesn't encompass one uh, on the x-axis. Well, then there is evidence that there is a real increase in suicidal thoughts and behaviours. And that's what we see with people under 18. There's um, evidence on, in these trials, and all this data comes from um, analysis of this trial data, that there was an increase in suicidal thoughts and behaviours in people under the 18 treated with an antidepressant medication compared to people treated with placebo. And this is obviously a real worry for us, since one of the reasons we might want to use these medications is because we're worried about the suicidal thoughts and behaviours in young people. So I should add as a, as a note to these studies is that there were actually no suicides in any of these studies. So we can't say, even though the length might seem logical, that they cause they might cause suicide in, young, in some young people. Um, but we can say that they um, do lead to this real increase in suicidal thoughts and behaviour. What you might also see from that chart is that the 18 to 24 year olds, um, there, that, that confidence interval line does actually encompass one, but only just. And, uh, and there's, uh, I think you can see enough of an impression of a fairly linear um, effect of age where the, um, where the effect on suicidality becomes smaller and smaller, such that in older people, it's um, protective against 
these suicidal thoughts and behaviours, but alarming enough in the 18 to 24-year-old um, age group that the FDA in America did extend their warning that these medications could cause suicidal thoughts and behaviours right up to the age of 24. I presented that earlier a meta-analysis by Bridge and colleagues of antidepressants and um, this is again trying to quantify um, um, the effects of um, antidepressant medications on suicidal thoughts and behaviours to try to put it into some context. So in their meta-analysis they showed that 3% of the antidepressant treated participants, 3% of them um, um, developed um, suicidal thoughts and behaviours compared to 2% in um, the young people receiving placebo. In their analysis, contrary to some other analyses, they showed the risk difference um, of 1% wasn't significant, but only just missed statistical significance. And they um, um, present a, um, a, a, an indice known as the number needed to harm, which is similar to the number needed to treat, in that uh, a number needed to harm of 112 means we need to treat 112 people with medication versus placebo for one of them to develop suicidal thoughts and behaviours. And uh, I think that is important context. Of course, um, you might well wait that um, that harm has been more significant than the uh, potential of it helping. But um, it isn't. It isn't very common, I think, for these medications to cause it. The effect seems to be real, though. And that was reinforced by this um, uh, study in the British Medical Journal, also out this year, which got quite a bit of media um, coverage. And they really confirmed that there was this increased risk of suicidality in uh, young people treated with antidepressants. They showed you know, similar, a similar rate of suicidal thoughts and behaviours of 3%. They showed a, um, a lower number developed these thoughts and behaviours with placebo and they produced the statistic of a number needed to harm of 52, suggesting that 52 people need to be treated with medication versus placebo for one of them to develop suicidal thoughts and behaviours. And the first time they looked at... Um, potential of these medications to cause an increase in aggressive behaviours. Now these weren't well studied, they note in the, in the studies they included in their analyses, they weren't sort of systematically recorded and were recorded in a fairly ad hoc way, but um, they found um, evidence consistent with these medications causing a similar increase in um, aggressive behaviours in young people with um, a number need to harm of 44, suggesting 44 people need to be treated with the medication compared to placebo for one of them to become more aggressive. And these are obviously worrying side effects. So why do antidepressants cause this increase in suicidality and aggression in some young patients? And we aren't clear. And, uh, and what I'm uh, suggesting now is, uh, is um, conjectural and, um, and I guess, um, based on some some consensus opinion by psychiatrists who work with young people as to what it's likely to mean, but it really does need um, better research to fully understand it. So I think we all observe that antidepressants can cause this the feeling of restlessness and agitation in some young people. Um, it's a symptom referred to as akathisia, meaning that people can sometimes feel this internal sense of restlessness of not being able to settle, of being quite wound up. I think it's young people who are already feeling depressed um, when they then on top of this, get this, uh, um, get this sense of restlessness. I think this can really activate suicidal thoughts and behaviours and cause this irritability and aggression. It's a fairly rare side effect, but, but I think uh, most psychiatrists who have um, treated young people with antidepressants do observe it. Um, from time to time, not commonly, and probably in the ballpark of sort of one in a hundred people. But it's, uh, it, I think uh, it is an observable phenomenon. A related theory, and not necessarily mutually exclusive, is that um, antidepressants might unmask a latent bipolarity in, in um, some young people. So people who later develop bipolar disorder most often present for the first time as depression, so there's nothing to indicate that they will, um, that they actually have bipolar disorder they've only ever experienced a depressive episode and you're treating from the depressive episode and the antidepressants might actually be unmasking what later becomes bipolar disorder. Again, these are just uh, these are more theories than things that have been really demonstrated by the research evidence.
So these concerns have really, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, have led to this, um, these um, warnings from the regulatory authority in the US, the FDA, who's put this black box warning for antidepressants from 2004 initially in uh, young people up to the age of 18. And then on the basis, the basis of that analysis I presented earlier, extended it to young people up to, the, up to 25 years of age. People sometimes ask what the uh, TGA, which is Australia's um, version of the FDA, have done with respect to this. And they haven't um, produced a warning like this um, for the reason that none of these antidepressants have actually been approved for use in young people with depression in Australia. That's not to say that they have been in any way, um, um, that the approval has been sought and denied. It's just that the pharmaceutical companies haven't actually sought specific approval for their use in young people with depression, as pharmaceutical companies haven't um, for many medications used in paediatric populations probably more for strategic and marketing reasons that they would say it's unnecessary in order for have, to have the medication available here, that they have sought TGA approval um, for it. And official guidelines have um, so recognised that, uh, that these are questions, um, uh, the questions regarding when to start antidepressants, when and whether to start them in young people, um, is one with that. Um, clear answers. So, in the uh, Australian guidelines produced by the NHMRC and Beyond the Blue, suggest that you know, prescription of the SSRI fluoxetine should be considered for acute short term reduction of depressive symptoms in adolescents with moderate to severe major depressive disorder where psychological therapy has not been effective, is not available, or is refused, or if symptoms are severe. So, reinforcing this idea that fluoxetine, if you are going to use medication, then um, the research evidence suggests it should be fluoxetine. Um, that most young people, you know, should should have already um, been um, seeing um, someone for psychological therapy that hasn't helped, um, and it's only at that point that you might add a medication. But the, the um, Australian guidelines do acknowledge that um, sometimes the psychological therapy isn't available to young people. Some young people don't want to see someone for therapy, or some, when the symptoms are particularly severe you might consider starting them both together without waiting for a failure to respond to a psychological therapy. The NICE guidelines in the UK were um, in their original version a bit more, um, um, uh, uh, weren't keen that anybody ever start medication who, had, um, who hadn't yet um, tried and failed psychotherapy, um, uh, but they had sort of moderated, moderated them with their 2015 update to be more similar to the Australian guidelines. I suggest for mild depression, you shouldn't prescribe antidepressant drugs as initial treatment. For moderate severe depression, um, you shouldn't offer antidepressant drugs to a child or young person except in combination with a psychological therapy. Um, when you do consider this um, combined therapy, you should consider fluoxetine. And uh, um, you might consider it um, using them together, though um, they do suggest, which I'd agree with, that it's best to see that they um, first trial of psychological therapy and only when they don't respond to that you might consider a medication. So the effect of these warnings have been um, predictably um, to um, see some tailing off um, in the increased use in antidepressants at least in the US. I'm not aware that we have um, similar data in Australia so there's a very linear increase as we saw with general antidepressant use in the community, this linear increase over time, and really with um, around this mid 2000s, where you saw all these warnings and concerns and um, media um, that were reflecting the research findings, suggesting that these medications weren't that weren't as effective as we might have hoped, and caused these worrying side effects. We really saw right, the prescription rates um, tail off. Well, in fact, not necessarily to fall away by a lot, but not to continue with the increase we'd seen before. So in a pragmatic way, when we see young people um, in the mood clinic at Origin, um, we see mainly young people with uh, fairly severe depression. Um, they've um, um, almost always been seeing a therapist prior to their arrival here that hasn't helped. And of course, uh, um, all see a therapist when they are at origin, 
Um, but when the question arises as to whether we combine that therapy with the medication, and I'll talk a bit later about the evidence for that, um, this is our basic medication algorithm. So we first use fluoxetine um, because as we saw, um, that is the medication that seems to be most effective. When that hasn't worked, when we've given it a good go at a reasonable dose, which would usually mean sort of um, use over a period of sort of 10 to 12 weeks up to a dose of um, 40 milligrams, but that hasn't worked, we'd first consider switching to an alternative SSRI, for example, escitalopram or sertraline. Um, and where that hasn't worked, um, we would then consider changing to a medication in a different class, and uh, particularly the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, um, such as venlafaxine. And then when that doesn't, hasn't worked, we're really getting into fairly um, not evidence-based area um, where we look at augmenting the medication with, uh, with another agent. So in other words, we use an antidepressant and one of these other medications, that being either lithium, um, an atypical antipsychotic, mm -hmm. or potentially a mood stabiliser. So we have very little evidence in young people that these strategies are effective, but we extrapolate from, um, from the data in older people, which I'll tell you about now. So lithium is a you know, very old medication. It was um, first used in psychiatry a few hundred metres from where I'm sitting now at the Royal Park Hospital. John Cade in the 1940s um, first recognised its um, potential usefulness um, in people with mood, uh, mood disorders. And there have been a number of studies that have looked at its addition, particularly to the earlier antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants, and um, overall, it seemed to be a, um, an effective strategy, though quite a wide, um, a wide variety of outcomes in those studies. So to orient you to this chart, what we want to see is that diamond shape, which is the summation of the st all the studies, to be clearly on the right side of the line. So overall, lithium seems to be more effective than placebo when added to, a, um, added to an older antidepressant. And then there have been fewer studies with the newer antidepressants. One of the problems with lithium is it's been around for so long, since the 1940s. It's a simple salt. There's no, um, there's no um, pharmaceutical company that's sort of interested in developing it because there's uh, no money to be made from it and, and, and perhaps um, not a, a dwindling research interest in it. But we still use it in psychiatry because it is a very effective medication. And the um, overall data in adults, so this isn't in young people, suggest that it is an effective medication strategy um, to add lithium um, to an antidepressant medication. Similarly, the um, newer antipsychotic medications, um, I should say as an aside that there is um, a, a movement in psychiatry to stop calling medications antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, because they suggest that these medications are effective for a particular illness when that isn't the case. And this is, um, these medications are a case in point that can be effective in schizophrenia. And uh, for that reason, they're called antipsychotics, but they can also be effective in bipolar disorder. And in the context that we're discussing now, um, can be effective when added to antidepressants for depression. And this is data again from adults. I know evidence um, in younger people um, for olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, and aripiprazole, what we want to see is that red diamond um, on the right side of the line, and uh, and and um, and the, for the total, um, for the diamond representing the total being the right side of the line, to show evidence of effectiveness. And we can see that these um, these medications can be effective for augmentation agents um, in in adults. And the third um, class of medications are sometimes used um, uh, medications that are otherwise used in epilepsy. Lamotrigine being the one we use mainly now for depression on the basis of these studies. So um, not only is this not in um, not in paediatric group, but in adults, but it's actually not for unipolar depression, it's for bipolar depression. And um, this is data from the drug company um, uh, um, and really illustrates um, perhaps one of the strategies that pharmaceutical companies might use to get their drugs approved. So this uh, the company did five studies um, looking at treatment um, using lamotrigine as a treatment for bipolar depression. Four of them were negative, one of them was positive, but when you combine the five of them in a meta-analysis, overall it was positive 
And for this reason, lamotrigine is said to be an effective um, treatment for um, depression, but uh, the, the evidence actually isn't that strong. In our clinical experience, it's pro we would probably agree that it isn't a particularly strong antidepressant, but it seems to be quite well tolerated by patients who seem to quite like the, the calming effects of the medication, and we sometimes uh, will consider it as a medication strategy. So perhaps the most, you know, the most common combination that we see um, with antidepressant medications in the mood clinic is this combination with psychotherapy, um, and particularly cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, so cognitive behavioural therapy, you know, not, not dissimilar in some ways to the antidepressants, showed very strong effects early on. Um, and this is looking at the cumulative effectiveness of CBT in young people over the years. So originally it has these very strong, um, very strong effect sizes. These are you know, small studies um, generally run by people who are enthusiastic about the therapy and so might have all sorts of unconscious biases in their trial design. As time has gone on, the trials have become bigger, um, perhaps conducted by less enthusiastic and more sceptical researchers the effect size has got smaller and smaller to be, you know, roughly the same size effect size as fluoxetine. But there's still, it's an effective treatment and um, still remains the first line treatment for depression. The question then comes, you know, if uh, cognitive behavioural therapy is effective and uh, fluoxetine is uh, also effective, then is the combination of the two, you know, the most effective strategy. And our answer to this question mainly comes from um, the, what's called the Treatment for Adolescents with Depression Study, or the TAD study. This is a large study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health in America. It's a large study by, um, by um, adolescent depression standards. They enrolled over 400 patients um, between 12 and 17 years of age, and they're randomised to receive either um, the combination treatment with CBT and fluoxetine, fluoxetine alone, CBT alone or pill placebo. And what this study showed was that there was clear advantage to the combined treatment. So what we want to see here over time is we want to see the, um, the, the uh, a reduction in depressive symptoms. All four groups showed improvement with depressive symptoms over time. But the group that got CBT didn't do any better than the group that got a placebo pill. And that was quite a surprising result from this study. Whereas the group that got the combination therapy did, um, was clearly better than, than the group that got placebo. And this um, you know, raised, uh, people had all sorts of comments to make about this study. One of which was that some of the groups weren't blinded. So the group who got um, the CBT alone um, knew they were getting the CBT alone. They didn't take a, um, a pill, even a placebo pill um, as well. Um, and similarly, the group who got the combined treatment knew that they were getting the combined treatment. And what we know in depression is the placebo response can be um, a very strong, a strong response. And we can imagine that the group who got the combined treatment might have had greater expectations of getting better, which was reflected in the fact that they actually did get better. But nonetheless, this is probably the largest um, trial we have of combined these combined treatments in younger people, and seem to provide um, reasonably clear evidence the combined um, combined treatment was the way to go. The second study we looked at the way we combine these was conducted in the UK, um, the Adolescent Depression, Antidepressant and Psychotherapy Trial, or the ADAPT trial. It was conducted in the CAM services in the UK, which are very similar to the Australian services and tend to see more complex, unwell young people. They enrolled 208 patients so between 11 and 17 years of age. In this study, all, all the patients um, got an SSRI, but then they were randomised to, on top of the SSRI, either get CBT or just get standard clinical care, in other words, um, seeing their doctor from time to time and seeing the case manager. And this trial found no difference. So they found that when adding um, um, adding CBT to an SSRI had no effect compared to the SSRI and standard clinical care. Um, and uh, one of the um, one of the arguments this study was maybe standard standard clinical care was too good, so CBT couldn't um, add a lot. Another was that this was a fairly complex group of young people with uh, that many didn't have a simple depression and perhaps that was the reason why. But this wasn't so reassuring that the combination in this case was any more effective than just using antidepressant along with standard clinical care alone. 
And the last of these combined treatment trials was again funded by the National Institute of Health in the US. And what they wanted to do was look at um, what happened to young people who weren't responding to treatments. What should the next step be um, when you're not responding to an SSRI? So they looked at um, four treatment options that you either, at that stage when you weren't responding to SSRI, you either switch to a different SSRI, you switch to a different SSRI plus added CVT, you switch to venlafaxine, which is an SNRI as we discussed previously, or you switch to venlafaxine and added CVT. So in other words, a factorial design. Did you, on the one hand, did you switch medication to a different SSRI or venlafaxine? On the other hand, did you or didn't you add CBT? Now what this trial showed is in these young people who weren't already having CBT, adding CBT was um, an effective treatment approach. So people who had not responded to an SSRI, it didn't really matter too much what you do with the medication, but adding CBT was um, really effective. They didn't show any difference between switching within to another SSRI or switching um, across to venlafaxine. Oops. Um, but did show that switching to venlafaxine caused uh, more side effects. So the results of this study actually suggested switching to another SSRI was the better strategy because it was just as effective but had less side effects. But the key finding from this study was that um, CBT was an effective strategy um, in addition to medication where the medication had been effective. And lastly then, um, you know, there's been a lot of research now, um, and mainly small, low-quality trials, um, looking at adding nutraceuticals, you know, which are um, looking at adding sort of nutrients and vitamins um, to antidepressant medications, see whether they're effective. Only two of them have, uh, only two of these treatments have there been enough trials for us to, uh, 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 reasonable quality trials for us to put them together in a meta-analysis. Jerome Saris is a, um, is a researcher at the, in the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of Melbourne, and uh, he published that this year. So um, for folic acid, he couldn't, there was no real evidence. Um, overall, what we want to see is that diamond shape clearly to the right of the zero line, and we can see that diamond shape crosses the zero line, suggests that um, there is an evidence that adding folic acid to an antidepressant um, is an effective treatment strategy. What it did show is that adding fish oil to an antidepressant was an effective treatment strategy. So there's been quite a number of studies now looking at um, the addition of fish oil to an antidepressant um, um, for depression. Then I should say these are adults, not young people. But um, overall, that uh, adding fish oil um, was more effective than adding placebo um, to an antidepressant in its effectiveness for depression. So in summary then, antidepressants we can say have only really modest effects in young people. Um, Fluoxetine appears to be the most effective of those medications and there's really equivocal evidence as to whether the other antidepressants are that effective in young people. In addition, they have worrying side effects. In particular, you know, they seem to be very real evidence that in a small number of young people they can increase suicidal thoughts and behaviours, which is clearly of great concern. So CBT has only sort of modest effects in clinically referred patients, um, but is, um, is um, certainly remains an effective treatment. And the question then becomes as to whether combined treatment is better than, um, better than therapy alone. And the evidence we have seems to be that combined treatment is better than, uh, than using um, therapy alone. But where someone is only receiving the antidepressant and hasn't received um, any therapy, then adding therapy is an effective treatment strategy. There's really an absence of evidence to guide augmentation strategies for um, depression in young people. So we're really not clear whether the sort of treatment algorithm we go through in clinical practice, adding lithium or an antipsychotic or lamotrigine to an antidepressant is an effective treatment strategy in young people. And lastly, you know, the, the recent evidence suggests that um, adding fish oil to an antidepressant is a worthwhile strategy. Thanks very much. I'll hand back over to Helena. We're going to sit next to me and have some questions. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. That was really, really, really interesting. And I think especially as a clinician, kind of that evaluation of what the best evidence is for the antidepressants that we either prescribe or see prescribed is really helpful. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, we hope that that you guys enjoyed it and um, as we said before the webinar has been recorded 
um, and it is available, it will be available on the website and you'll get um, a notification of when that's up and ready for you. Um, and just before we take some questions, just to just to let you know, um, the Origin are actually um, have some uh, workshops um, that will be available very soon. We have an, um, an international guest that will be presenting in Melbourne and in um, Sydney. Um, and uh, the title, the topic, is around keeping families together when they come when they, sorry when they confront psychosis. I'm looking kind of at shared decision making and family psychoeducation. So um, have a look on the website for more information about that. Um, also, there is um, a spring sale on for our manuals at the moment. So please have a look at the website again and see if there's anything that you might find interesting. There's over 20 manuals um, in the broad field of youth mental health written by um, the researchers and clinicians here. So it might be worth having a look if anything that you think might be interesting for your service at the moment. Um, and also, as we said, this is the first in the series of depression webinars. So coming up, we have on the 1st of December, Professor Andrew Channon. On the 5th, we have Dr. Mark Phelan. And then on the 15th, Dr. Simon Rice. So again, have a look on our website and register to, um, to attend those webinars. Um, so thank you very much, Chris. We have a couple of questions, if it's okay. Um, uh, a couple of questions that come in. One was, um, I was wondering if there's been any investigations into the benefits of um, pharmacodynamic, uh, sorry, pharmacogenomic. thank you, um, profiling to aid in prescribing in this group of clients. Okay, so what I guess what that question is referring to is that um, um, we are able now to um, do a genetic profile of patients to see how they metabolise um, some of the antidepressants, to look at the particular genetic variants of um, enzymes in the liver, um, some of which are very efficient in um, metabolising the antidepressants, some of which aren't efficient. And the significance of that is, is that um, fast metabolisers um, will have lower blood levels of antidepressant, mm -hmm. and so are likely to need higher levels of that antidepressant for it to be effective, and vice versa, where people are, um, are not very efficient metabolizers, they're likely to have higher levels of antidepressants in their bloodstream, which on the one hand might mean it might be more effective at a lower dose, but also might cause more side effects. And the, the, the truth is, I don't think we really know that this is effective. It is something that, um, that the um, pathology companies try to promote quite heavily to doctors. It's quite an expensive test. It probably helps us a, a little bit, just so we can say, well, maybe that's the reason you didn't get better um, to escitalopram because you were uh, metabolizing it so quickly. But um, there is an evidence that doing that will lead to a more effective treatment outcome, or at least not, not very convincing evidence yet. But it's an active area of research. and. Um, doesn't do any harm except for its cost to, which is in the hundreds of dollars, um, but probably the evidence is too early to say it's really effective. Okay, thank you. And um, we're getting quite a lot of questions coming through, so apologies if we don't get some more, but we'll get through as many as we can. Um, what do you think would have happened if there was a group who had fish oil plus CBT without the SSRI? Um, that's, so that's a, um, so, um, I'm not sure if they're referring to the TADS trial where there was um, people got the um, either the um, CBT alone or they got CBT plus fluoxetine, and uh, and what we know in that trial, which wasn't blinded between those two groups, is the CBT plus fluoxetine group did much better than the CBT alone group. And one of the things we know from depression is that you know, there's a strong expectancy effect, so the strong the more expectation you have that you're getting a treatment that's going to be helpful, but that's um, self-fulfilling, at least in the short term. So people who um, expect to get better do get better. It's not sustained, unfortunately. Uh, it's an easy treatment for us, but at least in the short term, which means these studies are only over, you know, eight to 12 weeks, it is effective. If it was fish oil plus CBT, um, um, well, I'm not sure, but we are running a trial here at Origin where we are looking at that question, in fact, looking at fish oil versus placebo um, plus um, cognitive behavioural case management um, at the Headspace centres. And so we might have an answer to that question uh, sometime uh, um, about two or three years away, I think. Well, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is there a particular antidepressant you would use for a young person with insomnia? 
Um, no, is the short answer, because insomnia is a really, really um, common side effect in young people would see with depression. And, um, and uh, in my view, I think um, it's best to treat the depression as the depression gets better, the insomnia tends to get better. Um, having said that, you know, sometimes we will use um, short-term um, treatment um, with a hypnotic medication, so with a, a sleeping pill, which um, has its own set of problems, but sometimes be useful in the short term. But we don't tend to use a sedating antidepressant, so it's not uncommon actually that we see um, young people referred to us um, who are treated um, by their GPs with metazapine. So metazapine is a medication that um, does cause sedation and does help sleep. Um, but it's not a very effective medication in young people. There's really not evidence that it's effective and tends to have side effects that most young people don't like. So this daytime sedation isn't great, even though it's helping you sleep, but it also leads to weight gain, and most young people aren't too keen on that. The other medication that's only sort of fairly newly available is agomelatin, which works on the melatonin system, which um, you know, I think it's too early to say whether that's a really effective strategy. It's, um, it does in, in the times I've used it, it does seem to have a good effect on sleep. I would say my impression is, it, is that it isn't a very effective antidepressant, but there's possibly, you know, has some role in adding it actually to um, a medication like fluoxetine. So I didn't say in that talk, but, but, but it's an important point. There's very little evidence for combining antidepressants, for using two antidepressants together, and we don't do that at all, but the exception might be made um, that for agamelotin. Maybe that has a role as a secondary medication that will help with sleep on, on top of um, on top of using a traditional SSRI, but it's um, not an evidence-based approach. It's too early to say whether that would be effective, but I, but I think there's some rationale to it. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And um, well, maybe um, if we can get one more. Um, uh, many of the young people I see take their own antidepressant medication regularly because they want to feel better, but they also use large amounts of cannabis and smoke tobacco. What effects do these drugs have on the antidepressants? Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, uh, I'm not really aware of the literature that um, smoking tobacco has a big effect on the um, on the antidepressant medications. It might have some um, some effect on metabolism, but I don't think in any dramatic way. Uh, the the big concern would be young people with smoking um, cannabis, which is obviously you know, fairly common that young people um, do that. And the main um, main worry we have with young people smoking cannabis is that is that it has a um, seems to have a depressant effect. So it's more that the um, antidepressant is kind of working against um, the cannabis. So we're, we're trying to alleviate the depression um, with the um, with the fluoxetine. The, the, the cannabis is really um, making it hard to treat. So it's um, it's a very effective treatment strategy when people are drinking too much alcohol, or smoking too much cannabis to get them to address that at the same time as antidepressant. It's probably a more effective treatment strategy than the antidepressant in order to cut down on the substance use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.